Hello, everybody. My name is Rifki Stern, and I'm the head of the podcast department here at Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. And I'm here today with writer Adi Elbaz, who not only scripted the entire Homeland series, but also played Emily, who is our adorable American. If you don't know what I'm talking about, stop right now, go back, listen to the series. Uh, but if you've been following along, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Anyway, Adi, welcome. I am so, so glad, so excited that we're doing this. Hey, Rifk. This is so great. <laughs> uh, this is so fun. We've actually, um, for those of you listening, whether you are fans of Unpacked, whether you've listened to our other podcasts, whether you watch our YouTube series, whether you are follow us on social media, this is actually kind of a first. I think this is the first kind of behind the scenes thing we've done for any of our for any of our shows, any of our content. So I'm really, really psyched about this. Yes, yeah, this is a great idea. Thanks, Rifki. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, honestly, it wasn't my idea. It was so many people uh, who listened to the show wrote in with amazing feedback, but also with a lot of questions. There was a lot that they wanted to know. And we kind of said, we want to be able to address this. We don't want to just, you know, respond to individual emails and individual, you know, Instagram DMs. We want to really be able to have a bigger conversation uh, that involves all of you. Um, so for those of you who wrote in to us, thank you so much. We love, love, love being in conversation with you. And for those of you who didn't yet, but still have what to say and still have questions and still have thoughts, it's not too late. Shoot us a message. We would love to talk to you. So with that, Adi, I, I want to just kind of dive right in um, with some questions uh, that we got from people. And I want this to really be a dialogue because we really built this show together. You know, this is something that we have both been really excited about since we dreamed it up many know, months ago <laughs> over a year ago right like yeah it's been ages it's been a while i remember our first brainstorming session <laughs> let me just start with something that a lot of people actually wondered about because people a lot of people related to different characters adi i want to just ask you who you personally related to who as you were writing it who did you find that you were kind of drawn to on a personal level yeah that's such a good question um so I think I related to every character in different ways, some obviously more than mm -hmm. others. Um, so for example, a lot of the stories, I think like maybe six or seven of the stories, they were from the perspective of immigrants. And um, mm -hmm. I emigrated twice when I was very young. And so that sensation of being foreign in a way, learning a new language, learning new customs, mm -hmm. um, sometimes like not knowing what was going on, having a different picture in your mind than what the reality is. Yeah. So I think that sense of kind of like dislocation and that sense of being like, do I fit in? Where do I fit? You know, and 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 everybody has that in, in different ways, right? So right. you don't need to immigrate to feel like. Right. I sure. was just thinking. Yeah. That. <laughs> like, and then of course, like, you know, there's, there's a mix of folks. There's young folks, there's older folks, there's folks in their 30s and 40s, there's folks who are parents. So there's a lot of stuff that like, listen, I, I'm not raising teenagers, right? Like, so I don't, yeah. I don't relate to that kind of like, but I've <laughs> been a teenager and my parents have had to <laughs> deal with that. Right. So I don't know. Um, so I think I, I would say that I've related to to everybody in different ways. I think the person I related to the least is probably Rui, the bus driver, um, mm. which is just because he <laughs> he came out a little more aggressive than I intended. He came out, he <laughs> That's funny. I loved him. I know I loved him too, to be clear. But I'm just like, oh, you 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 don't take any prisoners, man. Like he <laughs> he's, he's a straight <laughs> shooter. Um, and in my personal life, perhaps I'm a straight shooter, but I would I would never <laughs> be that aggressive towards strangers. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. He was mean. Yeah, I was a little scared of him, but then but then when he kind of got into his story, he his that kind of gruff persona kind of melted a little bit, and you got a little bit more of a sense of you know, especially you know, Israelis by and large, Sabras had yeah. this reputation for being you know prickly, obviously, and and kind of intense and a little you know a little scary, and you know they talk about Israeli bus drivers, but you know he what he's been through, what his family's been through. You understand a little bit, you know, where they're where they're coming from. I'd hope so, right? Like I'd hope so. That's sort of the desire to make him yeah, relatable. I guess it, to right? humanize. To humanize, yeah. yeah exactly. Not even relatable, just, yeah. just human. Yeah. Yeah. You know, jumping off of that idea as part of the process in, in creating these these characters, you spoke to so many people. So many yeah. people who, you know, obviously every person is different. Even every person is unique. Yeah. But when creating a, you know, Moroccan character, you spoke to I think four different people and put elements of all of their stories together. And when you created Rui, when you created Shia, when you created Galina, all, you know, all, this was all based on different stories. I would love to hear a little bit 
more of some of the stories of the people you spoke to in making the show. Tell us about some of these people. And, and I guess that's also a related question is how much was, you know, creative liberties that you took with these stories and how much was actually based on the real story of these people? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. It's a complicated question. So I spoke to a lot of different people for every single episode. Every single episode has at least, at the very least, one experience that they actually had, and most of them have many, many more. So there's an established narrative, right? Like if you're Moroccan or if you're Russian or if you're Ethiopian, right? Like, sure. oh, I'm Ethiopian. Like my parents came in Operation whatever yeah. in 1991. Like, and yeah. it was really hard. And 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 those facts are all they're true. Those are true sure. facts. But what happens sort of between the facts, right? Like that's so so those are the details that like were basically lifted almost entirely from people's actual lives. So for example, um, with the first character that I wrote, Elaine, mm -hmm. there was a bunch of research that went into it. Um, just, you know, just the straight fact, like what years, how many people, what was life like, you know, once they arrived, et cetera. And then there's the, right. there's the like so somewhat more like smaller and less like the smaller details that like don't get put into history books, but like you can still find. So for example, what did the Shikunim, the housing projects, what did they look like? How many rooms? You know, right. like you're not going to see that in a history book, right. but you might see that in like an in-depth article or something like that. And then yeah. on top of that is the human story. Um, and those like the human details were the ones that those were taken directly from story. So for example, the story of the Jewish agency woman coming to Elaine's family and being like, hey, I've got a I got a chicken and some plum jam and some bread, and they're like, "Please leave!" Like, no, that that, that really <laughs> happened, right? To the source, right? Like, or and this really surprised me when I spoke to a lot of the um to my sources for the uh, the Soviet episode, so episode two, Galena. I had this narrative in my head that you know, as soon as <laughs> the Berlin Wall fell, uh, immediately all the Soviet Jews were like, "Oh my God, finally, let's get out of here." And that's not necessarily what happened. And a lot of the motivation right. for why they left is like, I, I remember my, I, I, it's still in my head. I wish I could have used this in the actual like one of my sources who was just like a hilarious, like I was laughing hysterically the entire time I was talking to him. And he's like so educated and so smart. He's a professor of, I think, Russian culture. He's he's amazing. He was like, the primary thing that got us out was, and I quote the direct quote, the unbearable grossness of our surroundings. Like the thing about like people peeing in the elevator, that's real. And that like, yeah, I would not have thought, like when I have in my head the story of Soviet Jews, I don't think like, oh, many Soviet Jews fled because they were just like, over this sort of like wild west where everybody was kind of abusing each other in their surroundings, right? Like, and that's not, to be right. clear, that's not everybody's story, right? But that was consistent in the stories of the the folks that I spoke to at least, right? So that it's less a story of like, or it's not solely a story of like, ah, yes, anti-Semitic persecution. It was, you know, like everybody knew I was a Jew, et cetera. You know, like it, it, it was, it was not just about that. That that was an element, right. but not a not necessarily even the, the the primary or driving force, which was shocking to me. So I don't think I actually yeah. answered your question because I don't think I can like. No, I think you did. I okay. think you did because I think it's so interesting to think about exactly that. This idea that we have uh, these really superficial, and I don't mean that in a in a. Yeah. And I'm not making fun. I, I'm the same way. This understanding of like, oh, why did why did Russians make Aliyah? Right. Uh, because uh, they this whole refuse Nick idea, right? Not time. Sharansky, Zionism was always part, like, you know, it, yeah. it, we have this vision of exactly what it was, and it's more complicated than that, you know? And that's true for every story. And I totally agree with the, the human elements, because I really, a lot of the scenes, like, I remember, you know, as you know, an editor reading some of these scenes and reading some of these stories and and just crying because it felt so honest. Like it felt like this was a real story. And actually, a lot of the actors who worked on the show said to us is like, you know, I'm not Israeli, but I really related to this character and here's why. You know, I'm not this, but here's why this is, you know, there's there's universal stories in the particularities, right? And we forget that sometimes. Um, so I felt like that was that was really, really valuable and really real. And I'm glad that you were able to kind of have that experience of, of talking to so many different types of people. Yeah, I, I cannot overstate just the boundless generosity of people who opened themselves to my like invasive questions. They were so... 
I'm sorry, there's a siren going off in the background, so yeah. <laughs> that's fine. It's Philadelphia. It's that work from home life. We all know. I live in a major American city. This is just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I spoke to so many people who were so unbelievably generous and, and open and, and giving, and they, they really allowed me into sort of the like most like i want to say like almost like the crevices mm. of their lives they, they were so can you give an example yeah i mean so one of the hardest episodes for me to write was the was episode five shia the haredi episode um and mm -hmm. the reason for that is that i in my day-to-day -day life don't have a ton of exposure to the haredi community um sure and i would say that there's a lot of division between Jews in Israel and the division and the misunderstanding and the mistrust between the, it's they call it the Haredi sector, which already just sounds sort of like othering, you know, but between the Haredi community and I, I don't even want to say everyone else because like it sounds like it's such an yeah. us and them, but, but there is there is a real divide and it is really fractious yeah. and it's really painful. And so I was really, really scared that, I would let biases creep in and that I would not do a good job of making this community of, of, of showing this community like the, the way that it it deserves to be shown, you know, with 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 full sure. humanity. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I'm sure I asked so many like I'm sure the, the incredibly gracious, wonderful, lovely people I spoke to, I'm sure they were just like. Who is this bozo? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, for example, like one of the things that in, in one of the early drafts. Shia was one of, I don't remember how many children, seven, eight children. And he was talking about like, oh, there's never any privacy. I'm so, that's so like, I'm so mm. squish, whatever. Like it's, there's nine of us and, and two rooms, you know? And the folks I spoke to were like, no, that's not authentic at all. And, and listen, I'm one of two children. And when I was a kid, I was like, oh, yeah. I wish my brother didn't exist. You know what I mean? I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, he's wonderful. I love him very much. Shout out to Sefi. You're much cooler than me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I was inserting my own sort of narrative of like, you know, what what it means to grow up as one of two. And I'm an introvert and I don't like to be a lot of, around a lot of people and I would feel so stressed out mm -hmm. and whatever. And so many of them, so many of the folks that I spoke to were like, no. And like, you can be an introvert in a family of seven kids and still feel, have your space and have your privacy and whatever. And so I, I just, I basically was just like asking them like really invasive questions <laughs> about like, right. what was that like? What do you mean? Where did you go when you were overwhelmed? What you really didn't like pull your sister's hair? Like, tell me more. Like, how did it feel that you had to like get four little kids ready for school when you were eight years old? You know what I mean? And like the the stories right. that I got, they were so they were so open. They're so generous with me. They were so kind. They weren't like, wow, you're making a lot of it. Like even the questions I was asking, I was making assumptions. I was biased, right? I was coming from my own place. It not from a malicious place, but just yeah. from my own place of like, wow, I don't even understand this. And, you know, and another good example of that is in the French episode, episode eight. I have family mm. in France. I was born in France. And Love that yet, episode. Oh, I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> that was also difficult yeah. for me to write. <laughs> um, they were all difficult. <laughs> but yeah, I was still coming with the assumption that all Jews in France are like terrorized. <laughs> and right. the reason they make Aliyah is because they're miserable and it's anti-Semitism everywhere. And like, and that is an right. impression I had, even though I was born in France, I have French family. I go there not often, but not not often, right? Like I interact, right, right, right. I think more with French people than your average person. Yeah, yeah. sounds like it. Yeah, and, and yet, and like that was sort of the first question I started with. And they were so, I think I spoke to four or five people. They were also like, they were so nice to me. When I was like, wait, yeah. really? It's really not, but what about this? But what about this? What about this person who died? And they're like, no, like really, it's not like, they were so right. gracious to me. And like, I don't know if I would have been as gracious if somebody were coming to me and being like, aren't you afraid to live in Philadelphia? But what about this? But what about this? What, like, I think I would probably eventually be like, dude, right. stop. You know, like, and they were so, so kind to me. I appreciate that. It's specifically interesting that you say that about France, because I actually remember right before the pandemic started, the last vacation that uh, I happened to take was uh, my husband Aaron and I went to Paris for a week. I remember. I put you in touch with my cousin. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was so cool. Uh, but right before we left, um, my husband wears a, a kippa, um, and he asked a lot of people kind of uh, either who had been to Paris or just who, who maybe knew a little bit more about it, like, what do you think? Should I wear a hat? Should I wear a kippa? And 
everyone in America, everyone, I don't think with a single exception said, absolutely do not wear a keeper. Are you crazy? You know what they do to Jews in Paris? Absolutely not. That is so scary. Yep. And then we spoke to your cousin and a few other people who either had spent significant time there, or who knew it a little better and said, totally fine. Not an issue. So he wore a keeper the entire time. I, I don't even think he got a second look. Forget about someone saying anything. No one, it just wasn't yeah. interesting to people, which is so different than the way we think about Paris and the way we think about French Jews relationship with Israel yes. as being motivated by fear and uh, and kind of anti-Semitism. Yes. Um, I want to ask you actually uh, to, to transition a little bit, just because I think this is actually the question that we got most from people. And it's something that we discussed extensively uh, yes. before making the <laughs> I show. I know what you're about to ask. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you already know. <laughs> yeah. um, basically, just in thinking about the different uh, personas and the different, and, and as we said, you know, a persona does not represent every individual. We're trying to tell stories of, of people that feel really real and give you a real taste. But of course, you know, our Moroccan character, Elaine, is not all Moroccans, right? right? Our French character is not our all, you know, fr uh, right. French Jews who make Aliyah, right? So that, that's obviously the case. But the, the, the thing I think that looms over many people, and I'm actually going to a quote specifically from Adam, who's one of the, the many people who wrote to us. He asked about Arab voices, um, Israeli Arabs, Palestinian, you know, different people want to be called different things, but Israeli but Arabs who, who live in Israel. And Adam asked, at any part of the planning stage of the series, was the possibility of having an Arab voice included in the series discussed? I realized that integrating that into the drama would have been very difficult, perhaps impossible. And yet, that is also part of the story of the homeland, which he put in quotes, about a fifth of the population. So Adi, I, I know that we've discussed this extensively, um, but I, I wanna kind of like talk this out a little bit. Yeah. We would be, Arabs are a massive percentage of the population of Israel. No question there. And, and if we're being honest, let's, let's be honest about language. This show is called Homeland. And they claim it as their homeland too, right? Israeli Arabs feel a sense of connection to the land. This is their home. Yeah. Um, why didn't we include Israeli Arab, Palestinian characters. There are a few characters that we didn't include, but the Israeli Arab was the represents a big portion of the population that we did not include. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. You know, let's be honest here because this is a really tricky, really sensitive topic, but I think something that's really important. A hundred percent. Um there's this book that was written, I think it was written in 2008, maybe it was just updated in 2008, called The Israelis, an ethnography. I think it's by Donna Rosenthal. Mm. And in it's a really good book. You should all read it. It's great. I might be out of date at this point, but since 2008 was a long time ago, horrifyingly. But in, <laughs> it, in, the, in the foreword, she, she writes something. I don't have the exact wording with me, but she's like, I'm telling the story of Israelis. Yes. I know there's a whole other population that shares the land. And she's not talking about Arab citizens. She's talking now about folks who are not citizens, folks who live in the West Bank or Gaza. And she's like, and mm -hmm. they deserve their story told with the nuance and the grace and the care and the empathy and the love and the attention to detail and the humanity, et cetera. And this is not the place where I feel empowered or equipped to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. So with Homeland, we debated this extensively. This is a podcast about Zionism, ultimately. And to be clear, I think we can and should be critical of Zionism. I think Zionism can mean a lot of different things. In the different episodes, there were some folks with complicated relationships to Zionism. It wasn't necessarily all like, yay, Israel, hunky-dory, right? Like some folks felt yeah. that way and some folks were like, mm -mm, no, uh-uh. Yeah. And with, sorry, my dog is like, panicking here. She has strong feelings about Zionism too. She wants to be on the show. I know, I know. She's ready for a close up. I, yes, I understand that folks in, in, in the West Bank and Gaza are not Israeli citizens per se, but if we're telling the story of Arabs in Israel slash Palestinians, I think we have a responsibility to tell all those stories. I don't think we can have yeah. one isolated voice in a vacuum. And then the podcast becomes something else. It's not about Jewish Israelis and or even Jews and Zionism, it's about something else. And that's another podcast. I, <laughs> you know, I would love to work on a podcast like that. I do not think I yeah. should be the only writer on a podcast like that, since that is not my yeah. experience. And I, yeah. I would be extremely afraid of, of of bias, and there would have to be a lot of like radical candor and openness and empathy. Um, but ultimately, 
and I, I, I don't know, maybe it was not the right decision. I, you know, listen, I'm, I'm- I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Yeah, but I guess the, the, the bottom line is it's a massive responsibility to do correctly. And it was not ultimately in line with the stories we were trying to tell of the Jewish relationship to Zionism, ultimately. So yeah. that's kind of the short answer. Yeah. And I really, really relate to the fear of tokenization. Like yes. when you said that word, it felt like it really like hit the nail on the head. You know, like I I, I think that, and that that's always a fear, right? Yeah. That's a fear with every single character, yeah. um, but particularly with a story that is so difficult it's to fraught. really to really nail and a story that we don't feel like, you know, I, I don't feel like I own that story. And I don't, I don't feel like it's, 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 if I were listening to a Palestinian podcast and they were, to, I, I would feel very on edge. Like, are you flattening my story? Yeah. You know, what are you doing here? And that would be really, you know, kind of, I would already start off very nervous and uh, a little, a little upset. Um, yeah. And it's tough, right? Because like, I, you know, in my mind, I'm like, well, okay, but what's the difference between you and non-Ethiopian person, a non-Black person telling the story of an Ethiopian Jew, a Black Jew? And sure. there is something, I think, different about it because of the sort of political reality that we're all sort of embroiled Absolutely. in. It's, it, is, it is such a political mess, right? Yeah. That like, I, 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 I feel it is a totally different thing to wade into that. Just me yeah. personally. Yeah, I think ultimately, you know, I, I agree with you when, and to, to just say, you know, candidly from my perspective as a producer, when we were really sketching this show out, I really did want to have an Arab Israeli character. It was actually very important to me. Yeah. And ultimately, I was, I was kind of talked out of it. And I think appropriately of sort of like, you're not really equipped to do this. Uh, and I think it's fair and I think it's accurate and it's unfortunate. Um, actually, Adi, I don't know if I ever actually told you this. As we were working on the show and I was thinking more and more about this Israeli after, especially as, as many people wrote to us about it, I actually started searching for Palestinian podcasts oh, wow. um, because I was just kind of curious. And I've been listening to a few shows, especially looking for podcasts produced in uh, Palestinian neighborhoods, Palestinian cities, West Bank, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. it is, in English. You know, they're hard to come by. Yeah. But I've really been enjoying it and hearing hearing stories from other perspectives and, and more authentic, if we're being honest, right? Those are more authentic versions of the story and I want to let them tell it and I want to listen. Um, so yeah, so I think that's been really good for me and confirmed and validated the decision not to try to tell their story. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's a little bit like damned if you do, damned if you don't. You know what I mean? Because I never yeah. ever want to, yeah. to uh, imply, God forbid, that Arab citizens of Israel are somehow not Israelis or not welcome in the big tent. Sure. God forbid. Like that, yeah. that's the last thing we Actually, wanted. Actually, one of the you know? things that, that I really appreciated was that so many people who wrote into us with this question, again, I think it was dozens of people with this particular question. I think all of them wrote not from a place of either, what is wrong with you? Why didn't you include Israeli Arab stories? Or from the opposite, right? No one wrote in, I just, I'm so glad that you didn't include right. Israeli <laughs> Arab stories because they should not be told. Everyone, I think universally wrote in, with a sort of open curiosity, right? Just just like uh, from what from we read from Adam, I was sort of like, hey, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. It seems like it was probably intentional, but maybe not. But I just want to kind of hear why you made that decision. And I really appreciated that. Yeah, we I, everything, just kindness, yeah. pure kindness. Yeah. Okay, so at, the, at this point, you've mentioned this a few times, and I think it's something that is actually critically important to our brand here at Unpacked. With every show that we create, every podcast, one of the things that is so, so critical for us here at Unpacked is this balance of loving Israel and, and not, not trying to hide that. We're trying to be very, very honest about that. I, Rifki, the producer of podcasts here at Unpacked, I love Israel. It is very, it is something emotional to me. It is something important to me. At the same time, nuance and the complications of a country like Israel are real and I think really important. Recognition of that is important. Hasbara, right, which is something that was really a buzzword, I think, 10, 15 years ago, maybe in, in some quarters still is, is not something that is the way that we, we want to tell the story. Those kind of like, you know, buzzwords of like, oh, Israel's amazing because of X, Y, Z. That's not the way we want to tell the story about Israel. We want to tell the story about Israel that Israel's not perfect, but also Israel's amazing. And both of those exist simultaneously. And, and you mentioned that a little bit when you were talking about, yes, about uh, the potential of an Israeli Arab character, but also when talking about 
some of our characters who, like like Eden, for example. Eden, you know, she's happy to be in Israel, but she talked about maybe leaving. If her career brings her somewhere else, she might go somewhere else, right? So so that's also, I think, part of the story. You know, Galina, uh, our, our Russian character, she had a hard time when she got to Israel. So that's also a big part of the story. And so I guess I, that's something that I think is really important to talk about. Also as a big picture question for, for everything, for this show, but for everything. How do you balance those two as the writer? How do you balance this love of Israel, but also talking and, and telling this, this sort of real unvarnished truth uh, and that it's actually much more complicated than maybe sometimes we want to believe? Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good question. Um, Sorry, it was also so long winded. No, I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> um, yeah. I, so I think in some ways, my work was made a lot easier by the fact that these stories were based on real people mm -hmm. and real people have ambivalence, whether they express it as ambivalence or whether it sort of filters in sort of in the cracks in the stories. So for example, mm -hmm. one of the things that I actually wish we had touched on more and unfortunately just didn't have the, the room for it and this got cut was economics and money. And mm. people, in, in, in Hebrew, there's a, a, the English translation is closing the month, i.e. being able to pay your rent, pay your food, pay your whatever at the end of the month when you get sure. paid. And a lot of folks in Israel are not able to do that right now. And that's, you know, one of the primary things at the top of their minds when they're going to the polls, Jews and Arabs alike, yeah? And so that is that a criticism of Zionism? No, nah, yeah, you know, like the thing is most, right. I, I would say in my conversations, most folks are not standing there thinking like, what is my relationship to Zionism? They're just living their lives in this country. Do you know what I mean? And that's true of Arabs, that's true of Jews, it's true of everybody. Um, and so to me, it was sort of less about talking about, you know, how I feel about Zionism, you know, like all caps, right? And more, this is what it is to live in Israel. And yes, right. there's we're part of this like huge, you know, 4,000 year narrative that like in some ways has found it's like almost the narrative crest, right? The climax, like, ah, oh, right. 1948, like we're back, baby, right? Like, and then- <laughs> Also, like, okay, now we actually have to like live our lives as human beings and like we, the lines at the post office are extremely long and like it takes forever <laughs> for a package to like be sent. You know, just like all of these normal things, right? I like, feel like what you just said is triggering to any Israeli dude, listening to this right now. I, it's triggering to me when I lived in Israel, right? Like, <laughs> I, I'm upset. Like, I have to like go cry now. Like, <laughs> but, but, but I, I, I don't even know if I'm answering your question properly, but like it's it, so okay. So th th there's there's two elements to your question. Why, one, no, is, I mean, I think I think what you're saying is that the the when you're telling real stories, you can't just talk about rainbows and sunshines because that's not how real life works. And, and no, not even that. It's not even just rainbows and sunshine. It's also big stories because yes, we are all animated mm. by the sort of this big story, this epic sweep of history, whatever. Like Ortal is is thinking about that all the time. You know what I mean? Like. And yeah, also, of course. and also, oh shoot! I have to pick up my kid from daycare, but there's traffic. I'm going to be in traffic for 25 minutes, even though I'm going half a kilometer. It's a little Israeli thing there, half kilometer. a kilometer. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I like cottage cheese, which is what I'm obsessed with. Costs way too much money, and taxes are insane. And I'm never going to be able to buy a house. And you know what I mean? Like these are all. Mm -hmm. And oh, a rocket fell on my house three months ago. That's cool. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's just all. <laughs> All, all sorts of like, yeah. and, and wow, everybody here is like my family and I can't believe I'm here. And my grandparents literally fled from mobs in Iraq. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's all these things right. like together and that came out in people's stories. Right. So like that, I think that's the only, like the, the only way to really balance it is like to listen to what people are actually right. telling you. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. It's like the yes. And of, yes. of life and of Israeli life. Yeah, Adi, I think everything you said felt really real to me uh, as someone who who worked on the show with you, um, but also as someone who who cares a lot about Israel. And and that balance, I think, is 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 so critical, particularly this idea of both recognizing that we love Israel and we want to tell the story of Israel from a place of, of people who really love it, but also that all of these real things happened, right? These real things happened in the lives of Israel. And okay, so, so for example, I mentioned often Unpacking Israeli History, which is a different show that we produce here at Unpacked. And in Unpacking Israeli History, it's very important for us to tell the real stories. So we have stories in every season of things that are really tricky the and black complicated. Eyes. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and sometimes they're not even perceived as black guys, you know. So we're just, we're, for example, you know, the, the story of Operation Solomon, right, of, you know, of, of uh, you know, Ethiopian Aliyah, right? The Ethiopian Aliyah is an amazing, incredible, beautiful, moving story that is also really tricky. And if we're not talking about the trickiness in Unpacking Israeli History, which is more of a, of a classic sort of history podcast, or in Homeland, which is a really personalized look at all of these stories, then yeah. we're not telling a true story, right? It, then it's it's not real. Then it's just, you know, writing a whitewashed version of whatever the story is. And that's not, that's not what we're interested in doing. We're interested in saying, yes, and. Yes, we love it, and it's complicated, and we still love it. And we're embracing it. We're not going to lie about what the story is because th that's not real. And also, we don't think that telling the, st the complicated story takes away from the love. Right. These are all really real. I mean, I think in some ways having a character like Emily was very helpful because Emily is sort of coming mm, in yes. where she doesn't know all that much. She sort of knows what she's heard, right? And so when she's talking to somebody like Nahi, for example, who lives in... We got a lot of flack for calling it a settlement <laughs> online, mm. but who lives in a community in the West Bank or Judea and Samaria called Tokoa. Um, and she's looking at him and she's like, wait, hold on. I, I heard settlements are bad, right? Like, aren't they bad? Right? Like, aren't you... Aren't you taking and, away? And not only bad, but a roadblock to peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A road, exactly. Oh, there's not peace because of yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's that's... A perspective that a lot of people have. And there are valid aspects to much of the critique, right? And I'm not coming here and saying, oh, I'm pro or I'm anti. I'm <laughs> I'm not wading into that mess. But I'm saying <laughs> that every sort of a lot of the critique, whether it's coming from the right or from the left, right? It, there, there are valid aspects to it. And yes. And well said. A little. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> I could be a politician. <laughs> be a writer. Yeah, yeah. With my hedging, just endless hedging. <laughs> but uh, just having her ask, I think, those questions is helpful. Mm. And you'll notice that I did not solve anything, right? Like I sort of solved with Nachi being like, "Hey, guys, this is a tough topic. We're not going to solve it today," because guess what? Yeah. Like. I no one solved it for the, like, nobody has an answer, right? Like, nobody has an answer that has worked for everybody. Yeah. So, like, we're acknowledging that there's complexity and that it's controversial. And we're acknowledging that nobody's come up with, like, a great solution yet. And yeah. I think we're also acknowledging, and this is something that I think a lot of folks forget. My, my cousin, actually, I was talking to my cousin in Israel about this podcast because her husband was one of my sources. He's an expert in Israeli history. He teaches high school. He's amazing. And she was like, oh, this this project sounds really like it's it's not for Israelis. It's for mm. folks outside of Israel. Wait, I, yeah, I want to cut you off just because it actually leads straight into something that I wanted to ask, which is um, the different reactions. We've gotten a lot of reactions from Israelis and we've gotten a lot of reactions from non-Israelis. And I'm wondering kind of what you see as the fundamental difference. You know, it sounds from talking about your your cousin that is doesn't feel Israelis didn't or at least the one Israeli didn't feel like she particularly connected to this this kind of way of telling a story. But yeah, like, how, how did you see the difference here? I mean, I I, I don't know that this is like a, a. I didn't have an Israeli audience in mind, right? Because like I'm I'm explaining your society to you. Like, no, you know what I mean? Like, that's not that's not how this is mm. working. Like, I do not live mm. there. Do I have Israeli family? Yes. Am I an Israeli citizen? Yes. Do I speak Hebrew? Yes. Do I go there all the time? Yes. Have I you know have I spent a very significant chunk of my life there yes and i don't live there i live in america fundamentally the society that i run in and the circles that i run in are not primarily israeli so i'm not telling this story for an, an israeli is going to listen to it maybe they'll listen to this and be like oh okay this is interesting but i think more accurate like i think it's more accurate to think they're why would they listen to this they don't they don't right need, you know what i mean like right well, and and it makes sense also because as we were kind of creating the show, we we created the character of Emily specifically because Emily was a stand-in for us, yeah. for me and you, the creators of the show, but also for the audience, right? Because we're all trying to get to know Israel a little bit better. And Emily does represent me, sort of like the person who's like, I... I kind of love Israel without knowing it fully. And I want to get to know it better by talking to Israelis, by really understanding the story. And I think it's okay that our audience felt the same way. Yeah, yeah. 
I think that's okay as well. <laughs> yeah. So one more thing. So most of the characters were immigrants, right? I don't know that that's necessarily representative. You get people on a bus. Like, I don't know that sure. six of them are going to be immigrants, right? And that's because we're trying to tell, like, we're trying to tell a story that has some drama to it and not just like every kind of everyday stories, right? Like that. And that's why maybe it's not, it's a less representative. It's a very dramatized sure. version in a lot of ways. And like, definitely, uh, you know what I mean? Like that, and that that's fine, but it's also not a hundred percent representative because who really wants to listen to 40 minutes of somebody being like, yeah, so my life is, uh, you know, I go to the gym and I have a four-year-old, <laughs> you know, like it's, a, I'm, I'm bored. Like I, I literally just fell asleep right. saying that. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, that's part of why we, we created characters from all right. people you spoke to instead of, you know, just, just interviews. Um, but before we finish, because this is definitely like I could do this conversation for another know, three hours, same. but I'm not sure if our I'm not sure if our audience is ready for that. Um, I, I there's one question that that uh, we got from an audience member that I just I, I keep thinking about it honestly, um, and I keep you know going back and forth on, on my own answers, but I want to hear your thoughts about this, Adi. Uh, Leslie, who is uh, amazing, Leslie's like written to us a few times, and she's just like she's the, the best. Person I'm ever. obsessed with her. Um, Leslie Shout out. asked. Of those whose stories you integrated into the vignettes, do you feel that they have been integrated into Israeli society or is there a keep to your own mentality? And I think what Leslie is really saying there is, you know, if I'm in a Moroccan who makes Aliyah, at the end of the day, am I Israeli or am I a Moroccan who made Aliyah or maybe somewhere in between? And Adi, from your perspective of, of speaking, again, you're, you're actually the one who had all of these conversations. What do you think? You know, what, what do you think is the answer there? Yeah. So I asked, I, I actually asked this question to a number of, of folks. Um, mm. And I think, and again, I'm not a sociologist and I'm not any of these people. So I'm not trying to speak. This is my impression um, <laughs> that fundamentally, yes, there is integration, but it doesn't happen right away. And in some cases, it is still happening. So for example, folks that came over in the 50s and 60s, their kids, they, they themselves, the integration maybe happened perfectly, maybe didn't happen, maybe it was sort of rocky as it was for most people, but their kids, 100% integrated Israeli. And we see that because Israeli culture generally has changed over the past 70 years from what its founders envisioned. We know its mm. founders envisioned sort of a very Ashkenazi, like it, you, you see it in, in the music that's on the radio and the foods that are being sold, like in, in all sorts of things and all these like, it, they seem like superficial markers of culture, but they're not. Like the president goes to a Mimuna, you know what I mean? Like, uh, which is a, a yeah. Moroccan end of Passover celebration. So I would say that there's, depending on when you came, there's a lot more integration. I don't, I personally don't know any, and I think that more and more as, as people mix and marry and have kids together, like, I don't know anybody who would be like, oh yeah, I'm a Moroccan first, I'm an Israeli second. No, like you're an Israeli right, right, first. Right. But I think there are certain communities where we're still earlier in that process of integration, um, which doesn't mean that the integration doesn't happen. And I think the only right. exception is the Haredi community. I there's not a lot of oh, integration. Wow. Right? Yeah. Like and that's by design. Well, that seems to be changing slightly, but very slightly. Uh, <laughs> it depends also no. what you mean. It, well, it depends what you mean by integration. If you're talking about like the right. workforce, that's, true. that's one thing, but culture, like are our Haredi women going to dinner at non-Haredi women's houses. I, I, listen, if it's happening, amazing. Tell us. I want to know. Again, I'm not a sociologist. I, this is just very casual observation from the outside. But it's my understanding that that culture is still quite separate to the point. And we mentioned this on Unpacking Israeli History, which is a show that you and I have worked on. And um, a lot of the research that we did for that has animated a lot of these episodes. So thank you. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but we talked about this. There's there's a show in Israel, I think came out in 2017 called Autonomies. And it's sort of like Israel's answer to The Handmaid's Tale. And it's, it's what happens if there's essentially some kind of a civil war and a Haredi population and the secular population just split off from each other. One lives in Tel Aviv, yeah. one lives in Jerusalem, and never the twain shall meet. And then, of course, there's a lot of drama. And listen, that, that that's a preoccupation. If you're writing a TV show about that, that's a preoccupation that's in your mind. You know what I mean? So I think right. that, that that separation, of course, it's very dramatized, very whatever, fictionalized, but that separation 
it's there. It's 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 the basis for a lot of drama. So yeah, and it's terrifying to think about also because for centuries, mm -hmm. for millennia, uh, we we've been praying. We the Jewish people have been praying for what it looks like to come back home. Right, to come back to Israel and to all come back together, right? People from all of the corners of the earth, right? This is a huge part of our liturgy, but also our, our poetry, right? This, this is a critical piece of the way we think about ourselves. And it's, it's hard. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm a naive person in general, but it, it's always hard for me thinking about the parts that, that don't work in the same way, right? The, the sticking points, the points of contention where we are sometimes even in the same place, sticking to different corners. But I think, Adi, as you said, I mean, it's it's a continuing process and we're not going to know what it looks like. I'm really nervous and excited and curious to see what, you know, Israel is going to look like in, in 50 years, you know? I have one final question for you, Adi. Um, just from your perspective, it, you know, thinking about the writing of the show, and I know you worked hundreds of hours, we, we both worked on the show, and I'm really, really proud of, of what we made if, if, you, if you left listeners with one thought, one idea, something that really, really stuck with them, if, if you got to, to pick what that would be, what would be, what would be something that you really, really want people to walk away with from, from this series, from this show? I guess what I take away from it is that history belongs to all of us, and we're all simultaneously part of this like big narrative sweep this epic story this this saga that's at least 4000 years old and we're also within that huge sweep we're also just like living out our own sort of much smaller human lives i think if you aren't intimately involved with with judaism and with israel it can be easy to forget sometimes that you're a part of this unbelievable tradition that you have this unbelievable heritage this richness behind you this history behind you and i would encourage everybody who identifies as jewish i would encourage you to own and feel proud of that that heritage that you have and to learn more and to remember that you know your your judaism is is valid and you're valid and <laughs> you can tell i spend a lot of time on the internet where people are very very mean to each other particularly around judaism because it's really especially if you're a young person it is so so important to me that you're you're proud of who you are so <laughs> that is my yeah. we're it's interesting we're we're recording this at uh, the last week of october in 2022 where in the last few weeks there's been all this drama around Kanye. Oh God, I forgot about it. Yay, whatever. Him. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're so lucky. <laughs> His comments about about Jews and all the reaction online and everything like that. And it's it really is kind of incredible how much I've seen online recently of people kind of coming out of the woodwork and saying, like, this is helping me double down on my pride. I'm not gonna let Kanye's comments define how I connect to my Judaism. So you see kind of the the stars come out and the pride come out and the decision to go to Shabbat dinners on college campuses come out. And that stuff matters. You know, that's not the be all and end all of Judaism, but that stuff matters. You know, that's real. Yes, um, yes. And I, I would also say that the other thing, like 100% totally in agreement with you. And I would also say that one of the things, this is totally anecdotal, but I see a lot of, I. <laughs> going to just reveal myself as a huge nerd here. I spent a lot of time on Reddit. Um, for those of you who don't know what Reddit, Reddit is. Reddit, I'm not familiar. Yeah, is that for, a new uh... For those of you who don't know what it is, good. Ignorance is bliss. Please, it's yeah, a best stay away. most of the time. But um, yeah, I don't have any other form of social media, but I guess I just like really needed to torture, <laughs> torture myself in some way. Um, and I'm, I see, I mean, every single one of the Jewish subs and the Israel subs, mostly just like lurking. And I see at least once a day, often more, somebody is asking, is my Judaism valid? Meaning, oh, hey, I grew up, one of my parents is Jewish, or maybe both of my parents are Jewish, but like, I don't really know anything about it. And like, what do I do? And mm -hmm. I feel like I'm culturally appropriating. Is it okay for me to wear a mug and dub? And I'm just like, like, the, the, there's so much sincerity in those questions. You got to tell them to head to Jewish Unpacked. <laughs> and, no, it's We it's can true. help them out. Dude, I know, it's true. <laughs> But I want to tell all those people, yeah. you're valid. Your Judaism is valid. You cannot appropriate what is yours. And what is yours is so huge yeah. and, and epic and beautiful and sweeping and like, welcome. Welcome to the tents. Like there's there's room for all of yeah. us here, you know, and that, that's what I would want yeah. everybody to take away. Yeah. I love that. I, I just got chills from that. So thank you for articulating <laughs> that so well. Adi, I just want to really thank you 
working on this has really been a joy. Yeah. It's been a project that I think, you know, as, as we talked about, it, it was really a dream. We didn't know what it would look like. We didn't. We wanted to tell the story of Israel, but we didn't know how. The story of, of, of people's story of Israel, you know, like, and, and as you said so well, it's such a simple thing, but like Israel is just a country composed of human beings trying. Um, and it's really special to have been able to work on this and be able to, to create this. So, so thank you, Adi. Thank, thank you, for, you. For this. Thank you to everybody for this opportunity. And thank you for yeah. trusting me with these, with yeah. these stories. Like I <laughs> thank you to all the people who were so generous with their time. Thank you. And yeah, of course, Rifki. Thank you. This is just going to be like a <laughs> circle of, of compliments. Yeah, exactly. And I guess we'll use that to transition because really, <laughs> thank you to everyone who listened, right? Thank you to everyone who listened and who wrote into us and engaged with us. And even there are some people, right? Like anything else who didn't like the show, who wrote to us and said, I like the other stuff you do, right? I like uh, other podcasts that I listened to from you guys. I like Unpacking Israeli History or I like your YouTube channel. This didn't do it for me. That's fine. That's you fine. Know, that's, okay. that's okay. Thank you for <laughs> trying and engaging and letting us know. So thank you. <laughs> this has been Homeland, 10 Stories, 1 Israel. As everyone knows who's been listening to this all along, Homeland is a production of Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. You can check out jewishunpacked.com for everything Unpacked related and subscribe to our other podcasts. Follow Unpacked at all of the social media places like TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Just look for at Jewish Unpacked. And this show was only made possible through you, Adi, and of course, all the people you spoke to, but also from the Coom Family Foundation, the Crane Mailing Foundation, the Adam and Gila Milstein Family Foundation, and the Skolnick Family Charitable Trust. I know that we just did this uh, behind the scenes episode, but that doesn't mean the conversation has ended. We still want to hear from all of you. Uh, if you are just listening to this now, it doesn't matter. We still want to talk. So please, please be continue to be in touch with us. Shoot us an email at homeland at jewishunpack.com. As always, we cannot wait to hear from you.